Well, good, good evening on a very cold night. So we're pleased that you managed to get out. And uh, no, I shouldn't say that because it'll probably get colder before the semester's over, right? You will recall that last week, Professor Kramer centered her discussion on community-driven listening to strengthen democracy. Now, hers was not the only presentation we've heard that emphasizes the importance to democracy of fostering exchanges and heeding voices that might be unheard. Recall the presentations by Hess on interactions across segments, or Latson Billings on misinterpretations of actions and cues. Those kinds of things do relate to the question of how uh, does communication play into what happens with reference to democracy. Even some of the presentations that wouldn't immediately come to mind do bear on that topic. Recall Maynard's call for improved communication that could render, as he put it, the strange familiar. So those on the autistic spectrum who might be regarded as strange, how do we render what's going on there familiar and recognize that what, for some, what seems familiar to others might seem especially strange. That same kind of emphasis, isn't it evident, also in the plea for Monica White for understanding those who face food insecurity. We should not assume that the answers are obvious to all. To a great extent, then, the discussions have linked communication to the pursuit of and achievement of democratic ends. Tonight, attention again centers on communication with the public, but with important questions about assumptions made. Professor Dietram Schofala shares with us, or will share with us, results of work he has, com he has conducted on communication in science. He seeks to unravel the ways in which people sense to make sense, seek to make sense of the worlds they encounter, and increasingly that's often encountering difficult matters from the worlds of science and technology. Consider such matters as nanotechnology, <coughs> artificial intelligence, genome editing, for example. But he's asking us, what are the implications for communication for public participation and even oversight of directions from the public. We are, we've been making assumptions that the public should be very much driving the dialogues, driving the pursuit of democracy. But what happens when the very topics are not ones that are easily understood by that public? So when we propose mechanisms and systems for improving communication, to what extent must the content be taken into account? Can we just say communication in general, or do we have to think about what is that content? Professor Schofala joins us from the Department of Life Sciences Communication. And I won't try to go through the very distinguished career that he's had here and elsewhere for I don't want to take more of his time as he offers us analyses on communication in science and the Wisconsin idea. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Cora, for that very nice introduction and probably a much more succinct summary of, of what I'm going to say than I will be able to provide. Um, the, 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 this didn't start well since I walked in here and realized I had my, left my computer on my desk up in Hiram Smith Hall. Um, but due to the beauty of Dropbox, I have my presentation here anyway. But uh, normally I'm a little bit more prepared than, than walking in without a computer. At least I brought my clicker. Um, what I want to tell you a little bit about um, is the work that we've been doing um, here in, in the Department of Life Sciences Communication with, with, in partnership with folks all over campus, the Mortgage Institute for Research, um, and, and touch on, on three things that I think are really um, particularly important. One, the idea 
that we're in a, what I would argue, a new time for science, especially when it came to the original formulation of the Wisconsin idea, the idea of land-grant universities, um, and us working with, with extension and, and others to, to what the original language was grow two blades of grass instead of one. That was the language in the congressional language that, that led to the, uh, or in the, in the congressional speeches that led to the establishment of the land grants. Um, but I want to talk about not just why the science has changed, but I want to tell you a little bit about other complicating factors, some of which are really not new, and that is human nature, some of which are not just new, but in, a ongoing, in an ongoing uh, transformation, state of transformation, and that is our media environment. Um, and then I want to put the spotlight a little bit on ourselves, because I think we as scientists are not very often, or are very often, doing things that, doesn't, that, that don't help when it comes to um, effectively communicating and dialoguing with various publics. And I, 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 um, in contrast to my students who tell me that my, my lectures always end on deeply depressing notes, I want to end up on a few more optimistic notes about what I think are actually ways of, of pushing the, the Wisconsin idea forward. So let me start with this new um, era for science and start right back when, when Charles Van Heis first talked about the, the Wisconsin idea. And I just highlighted a few things from his lecture or from his notes on the, on the topic and the university as an institution that's devoted to the advancement and, dis and dissemination of knowledge, which of course is at the very core, right? And not just dissemination of, dissemination of knowledge in the state, but well beyond. And, and I am somebody who, who came from Germany to study at this university. Uh, I didn't know where Wisconsin was, but I did know of the university and, and ended up uh, being here in, 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 in Madison. That's interestingly though, the, the, the mission, the normative idea is very much at odds with what we see in survey after survey after survey. This is data from the Pew Foundation, one of our big foundations that collects survey data about science and technology. And this is actually not a question of how much of what people know about science, but this is a question of what people think about where the scientific community is as far as a general consensus on issues like the Big Bang, which is a fairly established um, model for how we think uh, the universe developed on climate change, which is also a fairly um, settled area of science and evolution. And you can see half the public thinks that scientists are divided on Big Bang, a third think that they're divided on climate change, and about a third think that they're divided on evolution. So it's not just that, we're, that we don't know much about science, we also see the scientific community as, as deeply divided on issues that we're not. Um, and that's a real problem. Partly that's due to how we typically, as a scientific community, address this problem. And I think that you know, this is again embedded in the idea of the, our role is the, trans, the, the, the transferal of knowledge. Um, and often in communication we describe this as the knowledge deficit model. So the way we think about communication as academics is, well, there's a public who doesn't know, who has all these misperceptions, and if they only knew what they don't know, then they would be more supportive of the science, and they would be voting for funding of science, they would be more supportive of their public universities, and so on and so forth. So the general idea, and I put Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson here, probably somewhat unfairly, but somebody who really has often criticized the public for not knowing enough and has devoted his career to fixing that. The problem with that, and there, there's one that's kind of funny because it's ironic, um, and that is that it's actually that model is at odds with the best available social science. There are dozens and dozens and st dozens of studies that show that the more the public knows is uncorrelated at best to how supportive they are of science, and very often actually can lead to more negative views. So the, mo the people who are most opposed to genetically modified organisms, many of the groups that are opposed to vaccinations are actually highly informed. Vaccination rates are among the lowest vaccination rates that you can find in the US are in the childcare facilities of Google, Facebook, Cisco systems in Silicon Valley. So these are people that are trained on elite, in elite schools and they go off and they don't vaccinate their children while working at Facebook, at Cisco, um, and at Google. What's much more important, and this is why my, the title of my talk was, was saying, well, when, what, what happens when sifting and winnowing, when, when this idea of, of working through evidence has to go well beyond the uh, the science itself, and, and, and I want to end with that because the knowledge deficit model, the second problem that it has is 
they don't address many of the questions when we, when we just provide technical information on risks and benefits. We don't address many of the questions that many of us are asking about artificial intelligence and so on. I just want to show you some of those um, areas with, with a few examples. In fact, one of the things that we're really good at, I think, in the meantime, is managing the technical risks. In the past, we haven't always, right? There was asbestos, there were a whole bunch of other things, but now we've actually gotten really good even for CRISPR, um, so for these new types of gene editing technologies. Um, one of the big concerns in the beginning was off-target effect, so that we're editing the, the genome, and it's the way CRISPR works is almost like a search and replace in Word or in a, in a software system, where it goes through, it finds a certain a faulty sequence in the genome, it cuts it and replaces it with a healthy, healthy sequence, and so therefore now this is replaced in the genome. The problem is, if, you, if the search and replace doesn't work, and, or, or by accident replaces the wrong phrase, just because it looks like a wrong phrase, but it's really not a, a broken piece of the genome. That's called an off-target effect, and we're making a fix that we shouldn't be making. Um, and so that has been a, a concern for a long time, but actually in the last year we've made such tremendous progress on fixing that, that that's really the technical, the scientific aspects are not the problem. The problem for CRISPR is that it raises immense questions about what it means to be human. Should we edit the human genome in ways that is heritable? Should we edit the human germline in ways that is heritable, that's going to be passed on to future generations? What does it mean if we synthetically write genome and then insert that into the human genome? So, three characteristics of what I would call a new era of science. One is most new technologies emerge unbelievably quickly and with very little time for public discussion. Um, this is a software system called Palantir. It's developed by Peter Thiel, who some of you know as the co-founder of PayPal, um, also a big donor to the Trump campaign, um, who's developed a system that's being used in, in Tottenham, England, in, in Chicago, in LA, in other metro areas. And it's basically an AI-based system, so an artificial intelligence-based artificial intelligence system that takes social media data, location data, uh, friendship data from social networks, and predicts the likelihood of somebody committing a crime. Many, many of you have seen Minority Report, um, but this is Minority Report in real life. This is police saying, you don't know yet that you might be committing a crime, but we have a pretty good um, um, understanding of how likely you are, and we're going to enforce, let's say, traffic stops on you at higher proportions. Um, we're going to pull you over if you're in a particular neighborhood where you shouldn't be. And you can already see the civil rights um, implications of that. Most of you have no idea, most of us have no idea that this is being used, um, but it's a, it, it's a perfect example of a technology that's arrived really quickly. AI is already in, in kind of intruding into areas of our lives uh, that we didn't even know. Number two, not just is it arriving really quickly, it challenges our, our deeply held values and beliefs. This is a, a chimeric embryo, so this is a pig embryo um, with human that, that basically has a marker turned off for an organ and is then injected with human stem cells. So it's a mixture of a human organ that grows in a pig embryo. And already you can see how that's weird ethically, right? How you, what some of the questions may be arising. Um, as we're growing human, and it's, it, the, the, the benefit is clear, it's, it's, a, it's a tailored organ that I can grow in a, in, a, in a pig that then when it comes to transplants it won't be rejected by my body because it's tailored toward me. But it does require us to grow human organs in animals. Um, think about a Muslim patient, for instance, who wouldn't be able to accept this organ. Think about the idea of chimeric beings in the first place. Would an animal that has a human brain growing in it, for instance, has, have consciousness and so on and so forth? Should we create these chimeric embryos in the first place? None of these questions have scientific answers. They only have moral, political, societal answers. Um, and even the, the simple stuff, self-driving cars, right? It seems a pretty simple thing. This is, um, if you're out in Phoenix, Arizona, one of the most deregulated zones we have for, for self-driving cars. You'll see Uber cars, you see Google cars, they're all driving around, and more than once have they run over people. Not because they didn't recognize people, they still, the neural network saw the people, saw people and still ran them over. So what's the deal here? Well, one is that it's actually really easy to hack them, intentionally or not. This is a sign that Carnegie Mellon, researchers at Carnegie Mellon have developed as a stop sign, every human being would stop their car. Any, every conscious human being would stop their car. 
right? Every neural network that's currently on the market will read this as a 45 mile an hour sign, which has awkward consequences if you're supposed to come to a stop but the car goes at 45 miles an hour. This is how easy they are to hack or to, for just errors to occur. But most importantly, and this is again relating to these deeply held ethical questions, um, we're selling for the first time a product to parents, if parents buy a car for their child that is on a very narrow slice of instances programmed to kill their child. That the car will make moral choices. The car will have to make moral choices. It drives perfect weather right now. It, you hit black ice, self-driving car. It can either take out that elderly couple that's right on the crosswalk, or it can drive on the sidewalk and take out that kindergarten class that's waiting, or it can kill the driver. And it may be the best choice societally, morally, to kill the driver. So I'm going to a, to a store and buying a whatever that is, a Volvo, and that Volvo is a product that, has a, that is basically has a kill switch for me built in. And that's the most moral choice, right? The, the most, the, the, for that particular situation. Would I make that choice? I'd like to think that I would, but I probably wouldn't, that I would kill myself over other, over other people. Um, but it is a choice that's going to be made for me at some point. So what I'm saying is we're, having, we're dealing for AI, for CRISPR, for all of these new technologies with technologies that arrive pretty quickly where we need to deal with the consequences before we even had a societal debate that change our values and belief systems. And most importantly, number three, that science cannot answer with more science. Computer scientists can't tell me, well, we're going to find an even better solution. No, that it will still make those moral choices. Um, the algorithm will eventually decide um, what those moral choices are. Alan Leshner, who many of you know, um, is a, he's, a, he's the former CEO of, of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, almost took over the, the, the primate research lab here at Wisconsin at some point, but his wife made him, uh, uh, or basically put the choice in front of him to get a divorce because of the weather um, or to move back to the East Coast. And so he chose his wife over the Wisconsin winters. Um, but he, he at some point said, look, what we need, and this was early in the 2000s, he said, well, because of all of this, we don't need more science communication as in us telling people the science and knowledge deficit model. What we need is we need an honest bi-directional dialogue about both the benefits but also the perils because of the types of technologies that we're now dealing with. The tricky part, that's not that easy to do in a modern communication environment. Genetically modified crops, stem cell research, tissue engineering, um, you name just a few of the issues that this state has dealt with um, and where we're having a, a, an ongoing conversation between what we should be doing, what the university should invest in, uh, what the legislature and other people want us to do, and so on and so forth. And I want to talk about these three factors that, that complicate things first. One is us. Um, and we're weird beings, as we all know. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about the research that, from psychology and a lot of the work that we have done um, that complicate things. So one of them, and this is one of the, the, the hot topics in political psychology right now in communication, is the idea of motivated reasoning. And I'll tell you in a second what it is, but I want to just show, tell you two stories or show you two different ways of looking at embryonic stem cell research. This is George Bush 43, right? This is um, during his tenure. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, Tommy Thompson was Secretary of Health and Human Services, somebody who had invested heavily in stem cell in this state. Um, and, and Bush implemented funding guidelines that, that or uh, implemented rather, a program where parents could adopt fertilized eggs that, that were leftovers from in vitro fertilization. Um, and what parents could do, so these are parents that can't have children themselves, and, and, and they can basically adopt these fertilized eggs, and they get implanted, and they carry them to term, and then they have snowflake babies, as, as Bush called them. So these are babies that, that, that are unique as a snowflake, and that could have been used in embryonic stem cell research, but instead parents took them to term. It doesn't matter what your stance is on embryonic stem cell research. If you're in favor of it or against, you understand the dilemma. And you understand the dilemma when then Michael J. Fox says, we need to invest more in embryonic stem cell research. You can see how the exact same issue has very, very different facets to it. This is where motivated reasoning is really, really important because motivated reasoning basically says that if I put the exact same facts in front of you, we all agree. It's not that some of us watch Fox News, some of us watch CNN. No, 
we're agreeing on the same facts. I'm lining 10 cards up. We all in this room agree they're all true facts. Some of us will weigh more heavily those facts that fit our prior beliefs. Um, and uh, well, all of us will weigh more heavily those facts that fit our prior beliefs. That's what's called a confirmation bias. And we will discount a little bit more. We know they're true, but we'll discount a little bit more those facts that, we, that don't fit our prior beliefs. So a highly religious person will look at the same facts differently than a less religious person, a conservative person differently than a liberal person. And the pernicious nature of this is what's called biased assimilation, which means we assimilate reality into our value systems and beliefs. Democratically, if you think about it, the, the, the very idea of this, of this country, of this republic, is based on the idea that we're constantly build, com coming to the best conclusions as new evidence becomes available and we're constantly adjusting our viewpoints. Motivated reasoning says it's exactly the opposite. I'm not adjusting my viewpoints to reality. I'm adjusting my, my reality to my viewpoints. Um, and ultimately, I do that to protect my identity. Right? If I'm a, a deeply religious person, I, I can't believe that it's, it's OK to do research on, on, on embryos. If I'm a person like Michael J. Fox, who deeply believes in, in curing certain types of, 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 of inherited diseases or whatever else, or for CRISPR, same thing, then of course I don't look at it the other way. The problem is, for science, that's a really problematic phenomenon. Because the same scientific facts end up meaning different things to different people. And that's, in, again, in politics, you can maybe understand why you look at a, a transcript or a summary of a call with a Ukrainian president is, is seen differently by one half of the country than it is from another. But for a scientific fact, that shouldn't be the case, right? The same science should mean the same things to different people. Problem is motivated reasoning says it isn't. Let me give you an example from Wisconsin. This was uh, during the previous administration um, when we went through a number of budget cuts. Um, and and uh, 300 million came from the UW system um, and were taken from the UW system. And a lot of people were very concerned about what some of those cuts would do to research programs that were being funded um, uh, here on campus and, and elsewhere um, on, on biofuels. There were big grants that had matching money that were tied up in these 300 million. And people said, how do conservatives and how, do, how does the, the, the governor not understand how economically benefit, uh, beneficial this kind of research is? And we happened to, at the time, do a survey with the Corn Growers Association where we asked some of those questions. So we asked down here, this is, there's lots of statistical models behind it, but I'm just showing you the simple version. Do people get a lot of new information or little new information? So as, as, as they learn more, what conclusions do they draw about how economically beneficial biofuels are to the state? Is it positive or is it negative? Um, and for Democrats, the more they hear and learn about biofuels, the more excited they get. It doesn't matter where it comes from. And you can already see where the white space is and where Republicans are going to go. Um, and two things that are really important here. One, neither one of them is right or wrong. It's not that the Democrats drew the right conclusion and the Republicans drew the wrong conclusion. What's important is they saw the same newspaper articles and television stories, and they drew completely opposite um, conclusions. Second thing that's really important, and that's kind of one of our misperceptions often, the biggest gap is for the most highly informed. We're not polarized as a country because we're not informed. We're actually polarized as a country, and there are dozens of studies since we've done this that show the same thing. The more information people gather, the more polarized they become, and motivated reasoning is a, is a, a really important mechanism. I want to show you how motivated we are in our reasoning by, by, by giving you um, but, but with another study, this is work that we did with people at the, with colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, Kathleen Hall Jamison, who's the director of the policy center there at Penn, um, actually a PhD from here, from University of Wisconsin. Um, and, uh, and, and at the time, you will remember, Pope Francis was visiting um, Philadelphia and, and parts of the East Coast. Um, and before that visit, he had actually released a, uh, an encyclopedia, uh, uh, encyclical, excuse me, an uh, encyclical on climate change. And in an encyclical, he was not subtle about climate change. He said, there's, look, this is a, a question for humanity, and, and there's broad scientific consensus. This is man-made, and we need to do something about it. So very often, the argument is, well, if people start you know, engaging in motivated reasoning, maybe we can get a trusted messenger like the Pope, who will speak to conservative audiences who may, for climate change, for instance, um, um, you know, have more of a problem with, with a liberal 
academic or whatever else telling them what to do. Well, this is the interesting thing. So what we did is we basically, and I'll put both of them up here really quickly, um, we basically, basically looked at Catholics and non-Catholics. Uh, we looked at if they're liberal or conservatives. This is in surveys. And then we looked at climate change concerns. And then we broke them down into people that are either aware of the encyclical or not aware. So the darker lines are aware, the red line is, is unaware. And what you can see is that the partisan rift between liberals showing climate change concerns and conservatives not becomes even steeper once they learn about the encyclical. So in other words, we're digging in even deeper as we're getting a message from a trusted messenger that says, look, climate change is real. Democrats go, okay, it's even more real. And Republicans says, oh, it's even less real than we thought ahead of time. And that's not a problem with just Catholics. The exact same phenomenon happens with non-Catholics. And this is how motivated reasoning works. So if the Pope tells me something that I don't like, and I just showed you that I don't like, I'm going to adjust my views on the Pope. We also ask questions, do they think that the Pope has credibility? This is, again, same thing, strong liberals, strong conservatives. This is a bit flatter for the unaware, but the moment they become aware of the encyclical, liberals are like, Pope has a lot of credibility. Conservatives like, he doesn't have credibility. Why? Because if he had credibility, I would have to believe in climate change, which doesn't fit my prior, so I need to motivatedly reason my way out of it. Um, the same thing happens for non-Catholics, a little bit more extreme. So even the Pope can't fix this, right? This is how, how, how big the phenomenon is. Um, we will adjust our, our view on the Pope before we adjust our view on a scientific issue that doesn't fit our, our, our prior beliefs. And all of that is not helped at all by the information environment that we're in. Um, and I just want to show you a few pieces of, of research. Last year we had um, um, uh, Laura Helmuth here on campus, who is the science editor of the Washington Post. Uh, and she spoke to a lot of our student groups about what they do at the Washington Post um, with A-B testing and algorithms as editors. So algorithms as editors refers to the idea that now we have so much user data and real-time user data from your clicks on your iPads to what you spend your time on online to, to, to every movement you ever produce online or on mobile that I know exactly what you like. And I'm basically making editorial choices about placement much more about those user data than about editorial necessities or editorial um, rules. And a lot of that and the A-B testing part is really an important part here. So what the Washington Post does is when they run a story, um, and all of the newspapers do the same thing, they run it with five different headlines. So it goes live as five different versions. You, you click on the link, you will get randomly one of those five. Within 15 minutes, they know how, many that, how often that's been retweeted, how often that's been, that's been liked how deeply people clicked into it, how much time they spent with it. And after 15 minutes, they go with whatever the most successful headline is. So when you Google a story that you read somewhere and you actually type in the, the, the headline, sometimes you get a story that has a slightly different headline, but it is actually the story. That's when A-B testing switched a headline on you. So you can still tell in the Google search when the old headline shows up, but the link that you go to has a new headline. That's kind of when you can tell. So basically, we're getting news that fits our preferences rather than news that we should be reading um, when an editor used to decide this. Every timeline that you'll see, if that's a Google search, if that's a Facebook timeline where now seven to eight out of 10 Americans get their news on a semi-regular basis, a Twitter timeline, they're all curated. They're not chronological anymore. They're curated based on your personal preferences. We call this narrow casting. So it used to be broadcasting. You have three news anchors reading news and basically a, a finite set of news giving them to all Americans. Now we're taking the whole <coughs> environment of news and we're narrow casting it toward people's personal preferences. And every one of us gets a different set of news depending on what we like and what we don't like. And you can already see where the problem comes in when it comes to motivated reasoning and our tendency to only see and like what we already believe. Um, so this idea of narrow casting is, is a really important um, um, economic principle now um, in, in news production, and I think I have him on as a next person. Now, uh, he'll come up in a second. Um, I'll have a, another Wisconsin grad that has spoken to this. Economically, we're literally seeing traditional news dying out and, and algorithmically, algorithmically driven news um, picking up. So this is data from the Reuters, Oxford Reuters Internet Institute. They have an annual report. It's fascinating. You should look at it. Um, if you ever have the chance, this is the most recent data, 2019. Um, three age groups. This is depressing for all of us that are on the upper end, 
35 and plus is the oldest group that they have, right? This is all the old people. Um, um, and this is where the sample breaks, 25 to 34, 18 to 24. And then you have here, you have basically old news. You have direct delivery of newspapers, whatever else, television. You have news alerts that you have set up. You have aggregators like Feedly, like Google News, like Apple News, that basically put traditional news together and still deliver it to you. Now we're going over into algorithms and into basically algorithmically delivered. Instagram, Facebook owns that. Um, Twitter, Facebook, and then other social media um, applications. All of which are algorithm algorithmically delivered, which means you get stuff that really fits your preferences. You don't go there to, to get the New York Times um, front page or whatever else. This is where the younger groups are. This is the generations that are going to be the next generation of news users. I teach a large undergrad course in science and society, and when I ask how many people pay for any subscription other than Spotify, um, and maybe Netflix, which they share across eight different households somewhere in, on Langdon, <laughs> nobody pays for, for news, right? And so this is not criticism, this is just a new reality. There is no habit of having for pay a new subscription. That business model is dead, and now I have my Wisconsin grad. This is um, um, Vanderheid, uh, Jim Vanderheid, who, is, uh, who used to write for the Washington Post as an editor. He got a degree from Oshkosh a long time ago, um, and then started uh, Politico, which was the first almost online-only news outlet. It had a small f um, pr um, um, uh, paper footprint in, in D.C., um, and then started Axios right now, which is this, this narrow casting, short news towards your interest. It's actually a really great subscription service for those of you who want to get quick updates on certain topics. But he said this at some point in the New York Times, and I think it's, it's a really important quote, um, based on the data that I showed you. He said, look, economic survival for news organizations will depend on tailoring. The business model is dead of, of broadcasting, of taking all available news and everybody has them. The, the money that's being made right now is being made by giving people exactly what they want and keeping them on sites where we can collect data on them, where they're not going anywhere else because we gave them something that they disagree with and they're upset about. And that's democratically problematic, but it's economically a reality, if we like it or not. Unless we're willing to put large amounts of money in the public television system, which we won't do in this country, this is our new reality. So, Last problem that I throw out is, is my fellow scientists, um, because I think we're not always the, uh, the most suave when it comes to public communication, and I want to show you some of the more extreme examples. Uh, this is Michael Mann, who two years ago won the Public Engagement Award from the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, for being the best public communicator on climate. This is one of his tweets, um, basically saying, nobody with an R next to their name, no Republican is safe to have in, can uh, in, in Congress. This is a climate scientist, leading climate scientist, who basically says, if you're a Republican, I'm, you're not worth talking to. That's the group you want to talk to. That is the very group you want to connect with. And you're basically saying none of you are, are safe to have in Congress. Not useful. Richard Dawkins, um, who of course routinely um, calls everybody who, doesn't, who believes in, in, in God an idiot and, and, and people who are worried about some of the moral questions surrounding embryos, as, as not being scientific. And then the last one is Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, because that's a little bit more of a subtle one. On this day, this is on Christmas Day, he tweeted this, on this day long ago a child was born who by the age of 30 would transform the world. Happy birthday, Isaac Newton. Funny, absolutely funny. But trolling Christians on Christmas Day may not be the best way to open hearts and minds on issues that will deeply be deeply central to their faith. Right? So we're, we're basically going after conservatives, we're going after people of moral concerns regardless and maybe religious, and we're going after Christians on Christmas. That's not helping at all. It's not helping at all, especially when you look at these data. These are data that plot different groups in the US. This is one of my former students at, at Cornell, who is now at Northeastern, has put a report together, Matt Nisbet, and he basically plotted different groups on a scale from liberal to conservative, so their general value system, and from being a, a registered Democrat, uh, a weak Repu Democrat to weak Republican, a strong Republican. And I want to highlight a few groups. Here you have AAAS members. These are basically, this is a survey of, of general scientists um, and, and where they are. So one of the largest, the largest generalist scientific associations in the US, you survey their members, this is where they end up. Strongly liberal and extremely Democrat. In fact, they're so far out on the liberal conservative scale 
that they mirror basically where Tea Party members are, Mormon church members, Fox uh, News viewers. Right? It's almost the mirror. Is that right or wrong? I'm not commenting on that either way. I'm just saying they're on pretty polar opposites. Most importantly, this is where the general public is sitting. The general public is sitting pretty far away from both of these. Um, and us going after some of the values, where the, and, and this on average, where the general public is sitting, and the general public oscillates, right, depending on what the administration is. They typically move a little bit with the presidency in terms of becoming more or less conservative. Um, but this is, these are some of the disconnects. And I'm sure um, Kathy last week talked about this um, as well. So, as I said, let me, let me end on hopefully a few more optimistic paths forward because I think they're, they're, they're important. A, the idea that, that mental shortcuts or, or not using information is a bad thing, that, that us following some of those biases is actually not always a bad thing. And I want to show you at least two examples when those biases completely work. Some of you may have received one of these. Um, this is, these are letters, um, Center for Voter Information, where they tell you exactly how many of your neighbors voted or the, in, your, in your district and how often you voted. The only reason I'm showing you this is because the latest letter, I finally got my bar longer than the other people. In the previous <laughs> letters, it was exactly the opposite, which is the point. And it's called a social norms campaigns. Half of what we do in our lives, we do not because there's a good rational reason, but because everybody else does it. We know from studies that we don't buy flood insurance because we live in a flood plan or because our house has been flooded before. We buy flood insurance because our neighbor bought it. That's actually one of the strongest. Wharton at Penn has done this study. Um, we know that when solar, develop, when solar um, spreads through a community, it spreads literally like a cancer. It starts somewhere in the street and then other people see it and they start also putting solar on their roof and it grows out from there through the social contagion effect. So the idea that I'm paying attention to what everybody else does and I vote more and I put solar on my roof and I get flood insurance is not always a bad thing. Sometimes when it comes to wearing ties, it's clearly idiotic, right? I mean, there's no rational reason for me to wear a tie. It's, there's just no good explanation for it other than that's what one does. Um, so sometimes it doesn't work, but for these things it works. I want to show you another one that's really actually one of the most successful communication campaigns um, that, that we have, um, and you may not fully immediately get it, what that is, especially those of you who don't spend a lot of time in urinals. I'm going to blow this up a little bit. This is in, in Santa Monica, so they have a, a little shell. Um, does anybody know why that shell is there? Target. Target, exactly. And so some master student in fluid mechanics did this study at some point that there's minimal splashage if you, if you pee right on this thing. Right? That is the point. Now, I could explain that to you, and I can give you a long, lengthy scientific explanation. Um, or I could do other things, or I can simply, and this is, probably says more about the male psyche and how simple we are in terms of what we do. But that is one of the most successful communication campaigns that fixes a problem in public bathrooms. Right? Um, and you go to Amsterdam, it's a little fly, and you go somewhere else, it's another engraving, but it's always in exactly the same, same spot. Again. Sometimes our biases and our heuristics are not, a, are not a bad thing. Number two, I think we've, and then this goes back to Charles Van Heys, um, the idea that our role is to inform, and, and I think we've done a great job with, obviously, a lot of the things that happen on this campus. I think there's cooperative extension. I think a lot of people are at this university are speaking worldwide. They're, they're working in policy. I mean, Cora, others are, are really great examples. Um, I think there's some less traveled roads that, that we, should, we should consider going after. Um, and a lot of our work deals with where do people encounter science and technology. About 13% of Americans in the surveys say that, that they're very interested in science when they encounter it in news. 13, 1, 3. That's a vast majority that, that, um, that is not interested. On a good day, Nova Science reaches about 2 to 4% of households. On a good day. That means the vast majority of Americans never see Nova Science. Um, science and technology museums, among the most educated people with a college degree or higher, about 50% go to a science and tech museum once a year. Among the people without a high school degree, about 8%. Which means 92%, 9 in 10 Americans who, who in many ways would benefit the most from a museum never see the inside of one. And there are very good reasons for that. But where did people hear about nanotechnology first? There's these modifications at the nano level, 1 to 100 nanometers. And the answer is Terminator 3. Right? Terminator is when they first encountered nanotechnology. 
Where did they hear about cloning and some of the effects that happen if cloning goes wrong and orphan black? Um, where did they find out about CRISPR? Luke Cage um, canceled like all the other Marvel shows on Netflix. Um, was CRISPR edited? As were the terrorist attacks against minority groups in, in, in uh, designated survivor. So there were storylines surrounding new technologies long before any of us had the slightest idea what they are, and we encountered them in entertainment media. And to show you how powerful that is, I just want to show you two images um, of what a scientist looks like. Right? On the left hand, you have, um, you have Sheldon Cooper, a theoretical physicist. None of us have ever seen a theoretical physicist at work. And I think that's probably good for everybody, because I'm assuming it's not the most fascinating work to, to, to witness. But we all have kind of an idea of what he looks like. And we, of course, have all seen every iteration of, of um, Back to the Future and Doc. So one of the things that I do also in that undergrad class where I ask people if they have subscriptions to news um, is I ask them to give me in an attendance quiz so to know who's there. I basically give them a quick Qualtrics survey. They all pull out their phones. They fill it out. And I ask them to give me five terms that, in your mind, you link to a typical scientist. These are students that are pre-med. These are students that work in genetics labs. These are students that work in science communication and political science and sociology that, are, that work in, in dairy science all over campus. They constantly are in contact with scientists. And then the next day I come in and I basically give them a word cloud of what that looks like. This is University of Wisconsin students and what for them a scientist looks like. This is Doc from Back to the Future. A lab coat, uh, has goggles, is male, older hair. There's usually a European and awkward in there too as well, so which I find deeply troubling for me, but that's a different issue. And then actually the awkward is even shows up and nerdy and all these things, chemicals, balding, right? So you have the, the best stereotype that you could possibly have of what a scientist looks like. And then typically students say, well, that's not... That, that, that was an anomaly. This is, you know, we, we kind of didn't understand it. I'm like, well, this is what last year's class said. And this is what the class before that, and look, this is what the class before that said. So the point being, there is a, a theory that, that's been around since the 70s. It's been well tested. A lot of our work has, has done work in this area, has been in that area as well. It says cultivation. And it says when we don't have a good way of observing something directly, we take our images of what that world looks like from television and from media portrayals. And the more long-term those media portrayals are, and the more consistent they are, the more deeply ingrained that becomes. This is deeply ingrained even in the, in the, in the minds of our students who constantly are hopefully exposed to something that's not just that. And yet, when they're being asked, it, this is what they reproduce. Right? And this is not their fault. This is simply the power of how cultivation works. Um, now, the beauty is you can flip this around. Um, and this is exactly what the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine does. And this is what I meant by maybe there's some interesting new pathways for how the Wisconsin idea works. Um, this is Kenneth, Kenneth Brannick, who, uh, who is the director at Thor. And this is Barbara Klein-Pope, who for 35 years was the communications director at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And Barbara started a, um, she's now the, the, the head of the Johns Hopkins University Press, but at the Academy, she started a program called the Science and Entertainment Exchange. And what that is, it's a partnership between the academies in, in DC and Hollywood writers and directors to basically say, if we know that entertainment has that much power to shape our views of what the world looks like, can we use that power for good? And so Kenneth was, was at the, I'm, we're not on, first, on a first name basis, Kenneth Brannick um, was at the time working on this movie. Um, I've never met the man, so I should definitely not call him by his first name. Um, and Barbara said, look, what you're working on right now is Thor. And some of you may have seen the comic book. And this is the, the character that later on was in the movie was played by Natalie Portman. In the comic book, you can already see from the body posture, from the dialogue, the, the men are playing the real scientists. And then the females are the nurses and the kind of, you know, again, there's nursing is a very scientific field. But the way it's being portrayed is they're kind of the second tier scientists. And so Barbara said, look, you cannot reinforce that stereotype one more time. And they rewrote the script for Thor, and Natalie Portman actually became a physicist. And this was one of the movie posters that they ended up using. Uh, Natalie Portman is the woman of science. The idea that no STEM fields are not a male domain, and no females are not playing support roles in STEM fields, but females are the lead roles as scientists. Um, and I think that was one of the really big, and we did a study surrounding the reception of that movie with Barbara, um, as a co-author to kind of figure out, you know, does this really have an impact? But it's a really exciting, I think, 
venue to try and say, well, if we know that audiences are not where we want them to be, but they may be getting information about or, or first exposure to science elsewhere, then maybe the Wisconsin idea needs to go where those channels are um, rather than where we think they should be. The last thing I want to mention really quickly is I think we've, we've lost as a society the, the ability to productively disagree. Um, we don't listen to each other as much anymore. Uh, we engage in motivated reasoning. We live in filter bubbles. Uh, we see the facts differently, as I said, transcripts or, or summaries of calls with presidents and so on. Um, and of course, this was the idea right at the very beginning, the idea that, and this is how I start my class when I talk about the, the idea of, of, of the democratic system. This is what it was based on, that we have a public that's A, willing to engage in this, in this discourse and B, capable of doing it. Capable of doing it without yelling at each other and producing, and, and producing uh, um, um, negative outcomes. And, and, and that involves listening to the other side, which I think on both sides we have more and more of a, of a problem with, um, to come up with that ideally that best, that best solution. When I say we've lost that ability, I just want to show you quickly where we are. 1994, Bill Clinton, two years into his administration, the Republicans declare the revolution in the House, Newt Gingrich comes in, Bill Clinton loses, the, 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 majority, the, the Republicans take the majority in the House, we're, we're deeply divided, eventually we're going to go into an impeachment against Bill Clinton. Even then, we're really close together and you can, you can basically run, and Bill Clinton did run on re-election, in the center right, and win that re-election against Bob Dole at the time. 2004, Bush had started a number of, Bush 43 had started a number of wars, was deeply unpopular. Um, he runs for re-election. He turns out 9 million people in Florida and Ohio who had never voted before convincing that there's a culture war. We're still really, really close together. You can still win in the middle, which Bush ultimately, um, certainly in 2000 did. Um, and we can have a discussion about how that election went, but, but one way or the other, it was still possible to, to win on the purple. Um, this is where we were a year into, into Trump's administration. And again, this is not a Republican problem only. You see the, 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 the hyper-partisanship on both sides. Um, and, and, and you see that reflected in the Democratic primary right now and, 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 and what kind of, and how much of an uphill battle some of the more centrist candidates are, are having, and even some of the younger centrist candidates who are, who are like Buttigieg and, and, and others um, are having. So this is where we are as far as not listening to one another. I want to end with the, the latest project that we're doing here at Wisconsin. This is an NSF funded project where we're basically, the goal of the project is can we figure out a way to create public engagement with science? So these broad conversations that we need to have around highly fast moving, highly value laden scientific issues that don't have a clear scientific answer. How can we take the Wisconsin idea into a public conversation without polarizing that debate from the beginning and without one side listening or ignoring the other side and vice versa? My uh, collaborators, Dominique Broussard and, and Mike Zenos. Mike Zenos is the former director of communication arts. Um, Dominique Broussard is the current uh, chair of, of life sciences communication. And what we did is as a, as a pilot study, so this is a fear NSF grant that's, that's underway right now. But the pilot study was actually a really cool, interesting design where we basically um, said, can we use some of the same mechanisms that, that maybe make people wear ties and other things, or some of the same biases that people engage in, and turn them on themselves so they start becoming more democratic in their information seeking. So what we did is we took a totally non-polarizing issue, nanotechnology. It's not that conservatives or liberals feel strongly either way. Um, these are all students on campus. And we basically gave them a, in an experiment, we put them in a lab setting, they had to fill out a questionnaire, and then we said, after this experiment, what we're gonna do, and we gave four different conditions. After this experiment, you'll have to meet with other students and talk about the topic. They didn't have to meet with other students at all. It was totally irrelevant. We just threatened them with that, with that conversation. And one group didn't get the threat. One group said, we're gonna have to talk to other people, but they all feel like they have the same view as you have. We just got them from your questionnaire, so we know that they're gonna be like-minded. Then we said, you have to, to, the, to another group, we said, you have to talk to other people, and they're gonna disagree with you. This is gonna be basically your democratic decision-making discussion with other people. And then we, we basically, and then we gave a, the fourth group was, you have to talk to other people, but we didn't define it. 
And then we said before, you, before that discussion, what you can do is you can search information. And here's a, a, a website you can go to, and it's a so-called gated information environment. So they can go online, they can click on articles, but they can't go beyond the articles that we defined for them. So it's programmed that way. Um, the articles are grouped into three groups. They're probably about 20, 30 articles. Some of them are just general news. So this would be your general information processing, science and medicine news. And then this is the interesting one, because we basically give them an option to go to articles that show both sides of the issue, where they get arguments from the other side and from their own side. So it's not just feeding your own position and kind of a motivated reasoning selective exposure way, but it's saying you actually go to the other side. And then we, we basically track for 16 or however minutes what they do and where they go first and what percentage they spend on, on certain content. And you'll see really quickly down here, these are the percentages that go as a first click to this two-sided information. Everybody who is in the talk condition, everybody who knows that they will have to talk to other people, is much more likely to go to the two-sided information than the group who doesn't think that it has to talk to other people. Right, so if I think I can stay away from people who disagree with me, I'm much less likely to go here and I'm just like looking at general news, it doesn't really matter. Um, but even within these groups, what you see is this is the highest number by far. So the moment I know I'm exposed to people that, dis that I disagree with, I'm using news much more responsibly from a democratic perspective, meaning I'm actually trying to get both sides. Partly because I don't want to look like an idiot and partly because I want to have ammunition if I get attacked on my... So I want to know where these people are coming from. And that's exactly what we would want. Two outcomes, right? I engage with the other side and, my, and I stick with my original opinion. It's now a better opinion because I've engaged with the other side. Or I engage with the other side and my opinion becomes now weaker or even changes because of better arguments. I'm also ending up with a better opinion. Either way, I'm ending up with a better opinion by engaging with the other side. And that's kind of what we're now trying to, can we actually use the social accountability manipulation? And we're not the only ones who are working on this. Uh, Phil Tetlock um, at Penn is working on this and others. How can we use some of those mechanisms that we've always almost taken out with this new information environment because I can avoid any viewpoint that I don't like? How can we bring that back into democracy to ultimately produce a, a better version of the, of the Wisconsin idea and a better way of, of communicating about science? So. I'll leave it at that. For those of you who are interested, um, there were three special issues of PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academies, uh, that are all available for free. Um, where you can find a lot of these studies outlined, some of them that I presented, but a lot of others as well. There's a report from the National Academies on communicating science effectively that Alan Leshner, who you saw, and myself chaired. Um, and then there's a handbook on the science of science communication that has chapters from Barbara Klein Pope, um, the National Academies that you saw from philanthropies, from people in political science, uh, in communication, many of them here at, at Wisconsin, Mike Zenos, who you saw, Dominique Broussard, who you saw, don't buy this book. This is an unbelievably expensive book. Um, it's, and I'm, I'm a, so I, 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 I will earn money if you buy the book, but you shouldn't because it's, it's, um, it's priced at a rate that I just find ridiculous. This is not taped, right, and going to Oxford University Press. But, the, um, but if you want to see it, um, email me. I'll send you a Dropbox link with all the chapters as PDFs. Um, that's the easiest way to, to, uh, to look at it. So I'll leave it at that. Um, hopefully I did leave enough time for discussion and thank you so much for having me again. Well, with such a, a far-ranging uh, discussion, I know there are questions, comments, observations that people have. So we'll turn now. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for uh, a great presentation, uh, both so style and substance, in fact. Uh, I had a question about something that you mentioned uh, towards the end about uh, the idea that we've lost the ability to productively disagree. Um, and I think that that's accurate, as, at least as far as I, I can tell. But I wondered. Um, amid the broader discussion that you were uh, having about kind of the both sides idea. And I wondered about um, whether or not it's even possible to productively disagree with people who espouse racist ideas, bigoted ideas, xenophobic ideas. And I think it's particularly relevant in the age of Trump uh, when there's this kind of expectation implied in your presentation that we Mm -hmm. sort of listen to the other side, but when the other side is espousing 
these kinds of mm -hmm. problematic views, how do you sort of reconcile that? Yep, yep. And, and I, I think that's a really valid view. Um, or or uh, I've had this, the, the person who asked me the exact same question is Paul Fanlon from the, from the Cap Times. And um, at some point, because I'd, I'd made some of the same points for a, a different presentation, and, and he came to my office and said, look, I want to write about this, but I'm not quite sure there's every person from the other side is either going to be receptive or it's going to be productive to have this conversation with particular groups. This is pre-Trump, I think, the conversation that he and I had. Um, and, and I certainly think that is, that is true that there is on particular topics or with particular groups, I mean, things are normally distributed and there are tail ends of that distribution ideologically uh, that we've always ignored. Um, um, the, the, I'll say a few other things on this and, and, and Kathy may have talked about this as well. Um, we've, we've ignored these things in the past or these groups in the past because we, we were able to and it didn't have negative consequences. So there's this, this, uh, this book that Paige and Shapiro wrote in the late 90s where they talked about the rational public and what they meant is the irrational public. Why is America making such good decisions or relatively good decisions given how woefully underinformed the public is? And, and pre-internet, the answer was because a vast majority of voters either don't go and vote or behave like white noise. Um, so they basically make decisions that are kind of random and elites are really driving the main discourse through media and everything else. Then we started mobilizing that white noise. And we started mobilizing that white noise when Bill Clinton came along and got, went on MTV and talked about boxers and briefs and about inhaling. And he mobilized young voters and all of a sudden young voters turned out and they elected Bill Clinton. Um, and then we saw that, again, Obama did the exact same thing. Right? He, he mobilized young voters, many of whom had little idea about how health care would work, nor did they care all that much they wanted to change. Um, and then Trump, of course, mobilized a whole different type of white noise um, and, and got elected with, with a group of, of, well, the Kathy spoke to, I think, uh, much more effectively or can speak to much more effectively. So I think part of the problem is now we cannot ignore that anymore. Right? So now we're, we, we, we can ignore some ends of the normal curve, but not all of them. But here's the second thing. I think one of the things, one of the strategies is that we are, and this is something that will, might get me yelled at, but I, that's, that, that's why we're here for and to have this conversation. Um, I think when, when for example, at, at Wisconsin, when we were told by some legislators that we were spending too much time on the ancient mating habits of whatever, our response was twofold. It was A, a deficit response saying, you don't understand, let's explain to you, let me explain to you how that really works. Bad answer, always a bad answer, right? No good conversation has ever started with, you don't understand, let me explain. And you can probably tell us from your own interpersonal relations, right? No marriage has ever lasted or that conversation. Um, but number two is, and then, and, and we basically spoke to those legislators directly and said, let us convince you why you're wrong. But that's not the right conversation. The conversation is with a vast number of voters who are out there who are deeply fundamentally uh, d decent human beings who actually want to make the right choice, who like the university, who see the economic benefits, having that conversations with voters who then will make the electoral choices is where the productive conversation comes in. And I think this is the danger for Trump right now that the Democratic Party engages in, that they're responding to, ex to extremism on one end with extremism on the other, and basic, rather than leaving, leaving the centrist middle open, um, saying, look, what can we offer you? We can basically go after swing voters in, in, um, in, in, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania that we didn't go after. How often was Hillary Clinton in Madison? Zero times. Yeah. Right? Um, where did she go on the, on the last night or two nights before the, before the election? She went to Philadelphia to have a concert with, with Jay-Z and Beyonce. Philadelphia is not her problem. The other end of the state is her problem of, of Pennsylvania. And, and so I think we, we left the center open for way too long, and I think part of the answer to it is, I think that conversation is a productive one, I'm fully with you. Some groups you cannot engage in, but in order to get those ideas out of the mainstream and out of the, 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 the uh, I, I don't want to say out of the White House because I don't want to be partisan here, uh, but in order to, 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 to get those things done, I think you need to ultimately return to the, to the center. And that may make me, you know, there may be a, a straight okay boomer response here, but I think there is some, some of that centrism is where our problem comes in, the fact that we're no longer willing to even engage in some of these arguments. Um, and that's unfortunately, um, I, think, I think, more and more true. And it, it's hurting science, certainly. Um, thanks for your talk. 
Uh, tomorrow has the potential to be one of the most polarizing things in the society, the hearings, the impeachment hearings. Can you see any way that this might be more productive of coming together? And I have a second remark. I think that teaching um, listening and conflict resolution starts in the schools, and we need to, we need to emphasize that. Do you teach uh, teachers? Do you do anything like that, high school, elementary, middle school teachers? Thank you. So I'm going to start with the second question and come back to the impeachment question. Um, so I think there are people on this campus who do a, uh, a much better job at teaching teachers. And actually, the dean of uh, the School of Education, Diana Hess, has written a book, uh, The Political Classroom. Somebody will know this better than I do if, if I get the title wrong. But where she's tackling that very question. Um, and so I think she would be really the person who does this kind of work and does this unbelievably well. Um, Oh, yeah, there we go. She has it right there. Um, and so I think there are people who do that, and I think I totally agree with you that, that part of that is um, in the classroom. I think the other part that's really important in the classroom is, is what I would call digital literacy. And that's the ability to navigate an information environment where increasingly it's unclear what, what authoritative, correct, curated information is. Right? So I can find basically support for pretty much anything online. Um, and, it, and we're increasingly seeing, gen, seeing generational gaps. It was super easy for me. I open a newspaper, I know exactly where I'm turning, I subscribe to it, I know it's curated, I know this employing science journalists, political journalists, and so on. That's no longer that easy. So we're basically, and we're, you saw we're growing up with a generation who is largely relying on algorithmic news. So it's not just that it may be wrong, it's also that it's wrong and it gets delivered to you because it's wrong. Um, and so the idea that we're, we need to navigate a, a, a totally different information environment where there's much less curation done for us and we need to do a lot more of the curation for ourselves requires a generation that will have, comp will have to have competencies that we don't have. And that is, I think, a large part of, of where K through 12, and for that matter, college, will be really, really important. Um, the last thing I'll mention is uh, Dominique Broussard, who I mentioned, my colleague, has done a lot of work on on what she calls deference towards scientific authority. So the idea that we accept science as the best way society has for knowing and for producing knowledge, which in an age where of misinformation, of disinformation, of my facts are as good as your facts or there's alternative facts, that becomes a, a more and more of a question, right? Are universities really the places where we're producing the best knowledge? I would argue yes, um, but I don't know that as a, as a given, so do I believe in climate change? Yes. Do most people in this room believe in climate change? I hope you do. Um, do you believe in climate change because you read the literature? Nope. Have you read the studies on, on the hockey stick, on the modeling, on the uncertainty? Nope. Have you read the gray sections of science that tells you why climate? Nope. So why do you believe in climate change? Because you believe that there's a scientific process that we publish in journals, that there are scientists who work at universities that are politically neutral, not like Michael Mann, who doesn't like Republicans, and so on and so forth. So I believe in the, and that's what she calls um, deference towards scientific authority, this, this ingrained value that we see in science. And that happens to be strongly correlated with taking science classes in K through 12. So if you, you basically, I don't teach you the scientific facts, I teach you the appreciation for what science can contribute to society. So I think that's the last part that I would add here, that why education is so important. For the impeachment, I can, I, I'll probably give you, give you more of a political answer than anything else. Um, I, I, based on all the data that I've seen, I'm not sure that's the most, um, I, I think it's an uphill battle. I think it's, a, I think it's for the Democrats. I think it's, a, it's as important to have this, in this case, as it was for Bill Clinton. I think it's, I, I'm somebody who became a citizen a few years ago, so I still have a lot to learn about your country or about my country now as well. Um, but most polling data doesn't suggest that that's going to be the winning issue for Democrats, especially if we're talking about a general election. That's, that's not going to be decided based on the four or so percent voters that turn out in primaries. I mean, let's not forget a vast majority of voters. 30% uh, of U.S. public identifies as a registered Republican, maybe 33. Um, about 20, 30 percent tend, tend to work, turn out in primaries. Um, and then you know, X amounts of votes are going to go on, on any given candidate. That's not a lot of voters um, that are going to decide that election. And they're going to be very different voters from the ones that are going to be out in that first Tuesday in November. 
So, um, and that's a long time. Um, and, and that latest poll that just came out that has Trump competitive in every single battleground state does not seem to suggest that impeachment has really helped in that respect. And again, I'm not making this as a partisan statement. I'm, you, I thought you were asking me about strategy for impeachment. Um, no, I'm talking about how should Adam Schiff uh, neutralize the negative effects of the impeachment by the Senate and the Senate. I think the transparency that, that comes with public hearings um, and the ability for different sides to, 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 uh, to publicly state their views hopefully will help. I don't, I, if I had that answer, I, I would probably get paid as a political consultant in D.C. right now. You didn't talk at all about conflict resolution in schools, teachers being able to help kids listen to each other and speak to them their own truth. Absolutely, and, there, and I think there are some, some lessons to be learned in, from more hierarchical systems where people have inherent authority over, over some of the students, um, but there are also, I think, some, as, as you say, I think there's some, some important lessons there to be learned. But as a matter of fact, that is what the theme for the lecture we heard from Dean Hess. Yeah. Oh, she spoke here, of course, yeah, I forgot. Well, thank you for a very powerful presentation. I, you've damaged some preconceptions that I've had. And I used to think that uh, they were uh, uninformed dunderheads on the other side. Now I know they're highly informed dunderheads. <laughs> <laughs> and the most important question, have you thought about wearing glasses and a lab coat tonight? <laughs> I, I actually should start doing that, yes, that, that, that's, that, because I'm, I'm beginning to get a bald spot, and so everything else is, is, is working out, so I, I think it's just, that's the next step. Um, yeah, it's like repeating what everyone said. I definitely enjoyed the presentation. Um, reading and listening to, of course, what you shared. The first thing that made me think of was how the Internet has, like, put this... Um, intense or like I need a now perspective for a lot of people and how that also has played a role within music I would say where attention spans where people don't want to hear a song that might be like five minutes long you want it two three minutes even albums yeah. cut down to maybe seven yeah. less than ten um, how that shift is also within academia where like hindsight I wouldn't pay attention but of course it's, it's a play a role within all perspectives um, I'm just curious where we look at this change within um media where of course having that physical news or relationship with like a newspaper compared to now technology has that I guess upper hand mm -hmm. um, especially within my generation how this change or like what possibly made this change of having something I need now can put it to a role for um, I don't know I guess given that leverage for seeking knowledge to be put back into those, I guess, to be educated. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think your observation is actually a really good one at, at, at two levels. Um, um, and, and one is, since you mentioned music, I think music is a really interesting one that's on the one hand, I agree with you that maybe that's partly attention span and, 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 and people you know, would never listen to a concept album anymore or whatever else, it's just like that, is not even, that, that doesn't even exist anymore. It's partly the medium. Um, but it's also part of the tailoring, right? So if, if I listen to Spotify and I start walking really fast, Spotify is tapping into my phone, counting my steps. So all of a sudden, my playlists are going to change that are going to be recommended to me because I'm probably working out now or I'm doing whatever else. Spotify is, of course, collecting um, 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 location data. So if I'm in an airport, I'm getting different recommended playlists than if I'm at home and... and and of course, it, you're watching the Sunday morning playlist, right, and whatever else you're getting. So part of it is also tailoring the idea that, that we're, we're actually offering smaller units that are tailored toward a specific thing. And I think, I think the music industry is a perfect example of that. Um, I'll add one last thing. You, you mentioned briefly the um, academics as well and, and, and kind of how we, how we do how we do work, and, 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 and I often find myself now you know, talking about my students and how they're just not what they used to be, and I'm, I, I literally sound like my professors. I'm just getting old. But the interesting thing is professors are actually doing the exact same thing. The Economist had a great study that since we've switched to online journal databases, so where now we can, I don't go to the library anymore. Right? I, I go online, I download PDFs, I do searches, I use Google Scholar, Google, Microsoft, they all have academic databases um, and so on. We've actually reduced the number of cite and the diversity of citations in papers. 
So in other words, we're, we're citing a smaller and smaller group of papers over and over and over and over again because we're basically, our attention span to the, to, to the hard work that is involved in, in sifting and winnowing through large amounts of information, we now have turned over to, to online databases. So even I myself, who's complaining about everybody else not doing the job, am doing the exact same thing by using a lot of the, the tools that make it more easily available to get stuff at my, at my fingertips. But that also increases the burden for me in my head of really having to go to Memorial Library, which I mean, I, again, this is one of the greatest libraries with awesome stacks. You can find stuff that you would, I mean, I've spent my graduate career in there. I have been back once since I've been a faculty. And, and that's a really bad sign. Um, so as, as much as I like to point fingers at other people, I think that same thing is happening in academia as well. To which degree, uh, and, and, and this is the last thing I'll say about solutions, the, 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 the problematic tr trend that we've seen with a lot of the solutions is that they work really well for some people. You can get unbelievably good news. It's called The Economist. It's unbelievably expensive. Um, if you really want to go behind the paywall of The Economist, you're going to be probably in 200 bucks. And so, which means, which means you're going to be rich. Um, if you have 200 bucks to spend on The Economist subscription, um, you're willing and able to spend that much money, which means we're basically creating a gap between not just the rich, but the information rich and the information poor. The other business model is to say, well, we're going to go with just eyeballs on the website. Um, that means you're going to get either your data collected or really crappy advertising and probably really short news bits. Um, again, we're creating a, a gap and, and there's research out of Minnesota in the 70s that Phil Titchener and colleagues did on knowledge gaps where they showed that, that the way some of these news are delivered, especially elite news, is that it widens actually gaps among the highly educated and less educated. So if you put an economist story that talks about statistics and whatever in front of a less educated person, then that person learns much slower than a more highly educated person. So aside from the cost factor, the, the, the way that news is curated is not made for, for, for narrowing democratic discourse or for bringing it together. So long story short, I think the solutions are very often, it's still available. You can still get that concept album and there's still people who make really good music and you can really find it, but it's gonna cost you and it's gonna, you know, you have to be part of certain communities and you probably have to live somewhere in a metro area where you have an unbelievably good music scene um, to use your music example, and the same thing is true for news, I think. Uh, but the curation is a large part of the problem. Sorry. I'm, giving, I'm giving way too lengthy answers. No, no, this is, this is wonderful. And I just want to remind people, we started the course by looking historically at the kinds of emphases that people such as Bascom, Van Heys had played, had made, placing emphasis on the importance of students being the ones who would be carrying the knowledge of, but what your presentation and so many others have shown us are the vast differences. It's not the same world. Wisconsin is not the same as what happened in the late 1800s, for example. That doesn't mean that some of the issues and principles and ideas don't deserve being analyzed, but they have to be thought about in the context that we're now operating in. And so this whole matter of using algorithms to provide people with, with knowledge, that simply wouldn't have existed at the time that Bascom was saying to students, you're going to be the intellectual elite for the state and the nation and indeed the world. So I think I, I would say that we benefited from both the very realistic analysis you've done, but also given a sense that there are still things for everybody to think about and to do. And so it isn't just a matter of saying, oh, it's all, un it's all hopeless, not oh, no. by, by any means. So again, please join me in thanking Professor Thank Schultz.